गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन होप यू आर इन्जॉइंग ऑल द सेशन एट काफा टूडे सो थैंक यू फॉर ज्वाइनिंग अस टूडे एट द काफा समिट आई एम हेयर टूडे विद बुराक टू प्रजेंट हाउ वी आर हैंडलिंग द टास्क मैनेजमेंट फॉर आर डिजिटल एसेट्स यूटिलाइजिंग द पावर ऑफ इवेंट ड्रिवन आर्किटेक्चर हेयर इज़ अ हाई लेवल एजेंडा दैट वी गोइंग टू ब्रीफ टूडे बिफोर डाइविंग फर्दर वॉट इज़ एन एसेट A digital asset can be a single asset like an image, text, video, or it can be a grouping of multiple assets in one bundle that can come from a camera roll. Each asset is critical part of the production with its unique contribution to stitch the final content. We handle the assets coming from multiple studio applications. If I put down the numbers, more than 100 studio applications are trying to bring the content that you watch on the streaming. an asset goes through multiple stages in its life cycle each stage is mapped to multiple standard task during the creation stage an asset is ingested into our centralized asset management platform where the content is in we are validating the content we are inspecting the content and depending on the content type we further execute multiple task on that asset in the management state assets are for the tags and categorized now for the distribution with global sitting vendors who are working on the animation visual effects on the assets we have to create multiple we have to execute multiple task on the assets we have to update the asset policies on our top of our assets also depending on the asset type for example for video we have to create multiple resolutions of the videos to generate different encodes that can be distributed globally with our vendors as part of the discovery we have to update our access policies again now task after the launch of a title a large percentage of the related assets can be archived so the task has to be executed to do the data backup and archivals effective task management is critical at every stage it ensures that each step is executed precisely and efficiently contributing to the overall success of our asset life cycle imagine a scenario where we ingested an asset but it is not discoverable because one of the task is failed intermittent in between some state that means our global vendors are sitting and waiting for the discoverability of the asset it impacts the costs at the same time it impact the timelines of our title productions here are some of the standard tasks that are executed during the asset life cycle some of these tasks can be independently executed while some are dependent on the completion of the task of others for example for every new asset content inspection task has to be executed to trigger the video encoding or image thumbnail depending on the inspection inspected content type of the asset we have hundred of task running on media assets a typical asset will have over a dozen task running on it new task may require to be introduced any time depending on the business need or it may be possible that we have to update the existing set of task with the evolving business needs the other issues with our task and task can be owned by one application or it can be owned by multiple applications of the studios we can implement such type of task management using different technical approaches one of them could be using the traditional state machines but with the fi finite state machines are based on a predetermined set of rules they often struggle to dynamically change with the changing states and conditions often proving inflexible in adapting to new situations a single error can halt all transition making debugging complex time consuming they function the another problem with such type of state machines is they often work with the synchronous processing but in our use cases sometimes we have to process asynchronously for example video encode that may take hours to process depending on the video content length and different other factors of the video now with separate teams owning different state a single state machine can lead to challenges in ownership and collaboration in the large state machines overall it can become challenging uh, and hard to handle the growing scale and maintain 
and troubleshoot any production issues with such large state machines. Another option to implement such type of task management is to use the large monolithic workflow. But over time, it would become so large that it would be hard to maintain. It is extremely difficult to understand the overall flow, such large monolithic flow. Making changes, adding steps is hard and error prone. It can also introduce a single point of failure in the system. Error handling will be tricky if we have one part of the system is failing. Now, ownership of these workflows can become tricky. Each sub-workflow can be owned by separate teams, and it's hard to define where each sub-workflow can start and stop, and who can debug which part. Now, to handle all these complications, I'm going to invite Brock now how we are designing our system using the event-driven architecture. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, to address this issue, what we did was to split the problem into two, uh, evaluation of the tasks and execution of the tasks. Basically, we keep the tasks very simple, like micro workflows. Uh, very simple, uh, mostly item potent, stateless, and at most one to two steps. Uh, we introduced a rule engine that listens to events uh, from asset management service. Whenever an asset is created or updated, uh, it, they, uh, we send out an event to Kafka. And we listen to these events to decide which tasks to execute uh, based on some rules defined in our uh, system. Once the uh, tasks are completed, um, we will send out another event to Kafka, uh, which we listen to uh, to see if the task is successful or failed, and we will update the assets accordingly, which in turn uh, will create a new event because the asset has just changed. So you can also do um, task chaining and other things. Um, so let's say we want to flatten uh, PSD assets. The PSD asset is a Photoshop document which usually consists of multiple layers. Um, what we want to do is we want to create a single layer by flattening all the layers uh, in the PSD document. But to uh, save on compute uh, resources, we don't want to do this for all the PSD files. We want to do this for the assets uh, smaller in size, um, maybe associated with a Netflix show, and also maybe tagged by the marketing team. Now, um, the thing is all this metadata come at different times. So technical metadata usually is added by other workflows to these assets. And the uh, things like movie ID or tags are manually added by users. And the order of these changes is not deterministic. But once uh, all these conditions are met, we want to flatten this PSD file into a single layer. Uh, now that we have the single uh, layer asset, we can define a new task definition to create a thumbnail out of it. So this is how we can chain assets on top of each other without really depending on how they were created or who creates them. So by doing this, we have uh, increased the understanding of the tasks. Um, loose coupling makes it easy to add new tasks or update the existing ones uh, without impacting others. Uh, abstraction uh, helps with improved monitoring. Um, the, uh, each task can be scaled independently and also debugged independently. It allows for distributed ownership. So if one task fails, uh, you don't, uh, the other tasks won't be impacted. The only impact you may have is maybe latency because someone has to uh, maybe fix, debug that issue, but uh, you won't have a single point of failure. Now, um, a high level design of the system. Uh, we have studio applications persisting their assets uh, in the asset management platform. The asset management platform is another service, a microservice that uh, we own. Uh, it basically uh, stores these assets in Cassandra and indexes them in Elasticsearch uh, due to high RPS and search uh, requirements. What we did was uh, we added uh, Kafka in between so that anytime an asset gets created or updated, we send out an event to Kafka. And we introduced this rule engine that listens to these events and evaluates the rules defined by uh, task authors 
to see if they are eligible to run. Uh, once we identify these tasks eligible to run, we start them and then we listen to, we monitor them. Uh, once they succeed or fail, they will send out other events to Kafka. In turn, we will listen to those events and update the assets accordingly. Now to give an example, uh, by the way, we delegated our task management to a conductor, which is a, a workflow orchestration engine. Uh, it is an open source uh, orchestration engine by Netflix. It allows you to define your uh, workflow blueprint and uh, lets you host and implement your <coughs> uh, task logic inside your service. So for more information, you can go to uh, conductor website. So uh, let's start with an example. We have a new asset uh, that's get, that gets created, 1.0 version. Uh, we only have a file location. We don't have much about it. Now what's gonna happen is usually the first thing we do when we receive an event is to kick off the MIME type analysis and file header extraction to see what that file is about. So that task is going to get kicked off. Uh, it's going to find out that this is a PSD file. It's going to, uh, we are going to update this asset with this information. Uh, since all the versions are uh, immutable, we are gonna bump up the version to 1.1. Now that we know it's a PSD file, other tasks can uh, kick off, in this case, a PSD file inspection. What it is going to do is it's going to inspect the PSD file in detail, um, identify how many layers it has, and other technical metadata. Uh, we are going to have a new version of this uh, asset 1.2 uh, with this information added to the asset. Now at this point, uh, no other tasks are eligible to run, but maybe a user comes in and adds the marketing tag uh, to the asset, in which case we are going to have a new version of the asset, and maybe we will have some other task kicked off due to this change. And finally, uh, a user associates this PSD file uh, with a Netflix show. And now uh, all the conditions are satisfied for us to flatten this PSD. Um, because it has the movie ID for a Netflix show, it has the marketing tag, and the metadata that we need. Uh, what is a task and what is a task definition? So a task is basically, uh, it consists of a few major elements, name and version for uniqueness and uh, identification. And then we have a set of conditions that basically defines the set of conditions that needs to be met for a task to be executed. Uh, we have our own uh, DSL. It uses JSON dot notation and it is open to our users. So anybody can come in and define their own conditions here. So uh, you can use simple or more complex <coughs> conditions to uh, define your tasks. Uh, we have a trigger concept, which basically indicates the specific change that can execute a task. You can think of them like uh, state transitions. For example, you, can, uh, you may want to run your task when it moves from inactive state to active state, but not from uh, pending state to active state, even though the end result is the same, like it is still moving to an active state, you may want a specific transition. Again, a similar DSL that allows you to define uh, your trigger. And finally, uh, a set of actions that need to be executed if uh, the triggers and conditions are met. And this is how a DSL for an action may look like. Um, now let's uh, dive into how we use Kafka uh, in our design. To begin with, we have a dedicated cluster. Uh, it's highly available. Uh, it ensures complete isolation so that we do not share it with other neighbors. 
Uh, we have 48 partitions and a, a relatively long retention policy of 72 hours, uh, which is uh, basically determined based on our use cases. On the producer side, uh, once the asset is persisted, we simply send out an event uh, to Kafka about this change. Now the question is, what do we include in the event payload? Uh, we can add the full asset metadata. Uh, in case of an asset update, you may want to include the old and the uh, new versions metadata. Uh, you may actually diff the payloads and only send what is changing. <coughs> Alternatively, you can only send the ID and the versions of the asset. Um, in uh, Kafka, the default message limit is one megabyte. Uh, that means you may hit this limit if your payload size is huge. Um, also, uh, creating the diff should probably be not should that probably be done on the producer side so that you don't add additional responsibilities to the producer in your main flow. Uh, on the other hand, if you only add ID and version to the payload, that means the consumer has to make a callback to fetch the asset metadata, uh, which means additional RPC that you have to deal with, uh, which doesn't exist in the other options. And finally, because of the small payload size, your Kafka storage cost is gonna be minimal if you only send the ID and version. In our case, we went with the third option where we only send ID and the versions of the asset and let the consumer uh, make a call. <clears throat> now, uh, the disadvantage of the additional RPC is uh, mitigated uh, because of the server and database layer that we have, which supports high RPS. On the producer side, uh, we don't have any uh, custom settings that we, we always use the default uh, properties of the Kafka producer. On the consumer side, uh, the, once we receive an event, we call the source of truth, which is asset management service, to fetch uh, the asset metadata. Uh, what we did was to uh, mitigate the risk of impacting the real traffic, we created a separate dedicated cluster on the producer site that the consumer can call so that it doesn't interfere with the existing traffic. Uh, then we enrich the payload with some additional metadata attributes like movie metadata. For example, uh, we may want to add if a movie is live or we may want to add if the movie is a Netflix show or not. Now, um, to do this, we could use another Kafka topic or maybe a global K table to join. Uh, but what we observed is to the uh, number of movies that we deal with at any uh, given time window is usually a small subset of tens of thousands of movies we have. So what we ended up doing is uh, use a distributed cache, in this case, Netflix EV cache, to uh, cache the movie metadata for a short period of time. Uh, then we uh, create a diff of the payloads of two versions of the asset and save it in our database for debugging purposes with a short uh, uh, TTL, short uh, life. Then we start evaluating the rules that we have on the system and acknowledge the event at this time. And if conditions and triggers are satisfied for any task, this is when we will start them and monitor them. Uh, when task succeeds or fails, we will update the asset uh, accordingly. On the uh, consumer side, um, we made some changes to the default settings. We want to only commit after we uh, successfully persist the event in our database. So we set the auto commit to false. Um, we updated the max number of events 
and the max bytes to fetch uh, to a lower value. Um, because on the consumer side, we actually process each event in parallel. So let's say we are fetching, let's say 100 events at once in a consumer. We actually fork into multiple threads and then process them simultaneously. Uh, this means uh, our, uh, we can increase our throughput, but to reduce the uh, load on an instance of the consumer, we reduce how many events we fetch. Um, let's say we have a new task that you want to introduce. Let's say today you only create um, one small thumbnail of images. And let's say we also want to create a larger size thumbnail for images. And uh, the question is, do you want to also run this task for existing assets? And in most cases, the answer is yes. So we built a admin framework to um, allow us uh, regenerate the events from the source system. So in our database, uh, we have all the assets, all the versions, and then we can uh, sweep through all the assets tables, um, create the events for each asset change, and then send it to Kafka for them to process. Now, uh, what we want to do is, because this is going to create millions of events in a very short time, we don't want to impact um, the regular production traffic. So uh, we created a separate Kafka topic, a separate consumer groups, um, so that we isolate this traffic from production. Um, we also need to make sure the services that we depend on can handle the spike that we generate. So if you are creating a thumbnail uh, for an image and you are hitting S3, for example, you need to make sure you won't hit S3 like a million times in a short time. So you, want, you may want to self-throttle. Uh, you need metrics to monitor your health, uh, the ability to slow down, uh, or even pause, event production or um, consumption, if needed. Uh, I'm going to invite Minakshi back for uh, how to handle failures and uh, adding uh, observability and scalability metrics to your system. Thank you. I'll replay this slide again, sorry. How many times have you seen your system falling apart when you're designing for the distributed systems? In the world of distributed systems, we often encounter something called cascading failures. One failure sets off a chain of issues. We design distributed systems, specifically event-driven systems, to make it more fault-tolerant and the ability to scale independently each of the services. In this design approach, services operate asynchronously, enabling tasks to progress without waiting for the immediate response. But what does that mean in terms of error handling? This foster of efficiency means that errors or failures may not be immediately noticeable by our clients. Instead, they start accumulating over time and you will get to know about these failures after a day, or maybe after two days, or maybe after a week. So we have to be careful while doing the error handling or the exceptions handling with the downstream services. For example, in case one of the downstream services is down, we have to make sure that we are not blocking our resources on the retries with one of these services. It can be also possible with our event-driven architecture that one producer is pro producing the events faster rate than a consumer can consume it. It is going to create a back pressure. So how you're handling such type of things, it's very crucial. Let's deep dive how we are doing it. We have to be very careful how we observe and monitor the checkpoints in the flow of event processing. As part of this, 
we should validate if the events are passing through these checkpoints while maintaining their integrity and they are not corrupted, they are not lost in this whole flow of event processing. And we also should be able to resume our processing from a known checkpoint in case there are failures happen. We should design with the failures in mind, not always the success in mind specifically when you are designing event driven architecture. Most of the time there is a tendency to group observability and the monitoring into one bucket. But actually they serve different purposes. Monitoring includes the collection analysis of the defined or the predefined set of metrics. These metrics act as a sort of early warning systems, alerting us to any abnormal behavior in your whole overall system. For instance, we might set up a metric to monitor if the image thumbnails are processes and if they are taking longer than a second, then it, we should be get alerted because there is some users who is sitting and waiting for thumbnails after uploading an image. However, the question arises now, how we determine which metrics to monitor? So there comes the observability. Understand, understand your system. You need to have the gain deeper insights of your system. You need to have a solid understanding of your system architecture end to end. We should be able to pinpoint any potential points of failure or the bottlenecks that can create latency in the whole flow of your event processing. Based on this understanding, we should be able to define the metrics that should be monitored and alerting us reactively when necessary. For Netflix movie production, imagine a scenario where an editorial cut video is ingested into a centralized ecosystem. This asset is expected to be distributed with global vendors, each requiring different video resolutions depending on their use case. Any delay or error in the video encoding processes can directly impact the distribution timeline of our assets with the vendors potentially delaying the creation of the final movie. While troubleshooting any of the issues, what are the top set of questions that comes to your mind? What is the issue in our system? For example, we notice a sudden spike in the error rates during peak usage hours. We need to understand what is causing this error spike. When and how this issue arise? Continuing with our example, we want to know exactly when these errors started occurring and what actions or events trigger them? Is it related to some recent code change or some client configuration? How much is the impact of the issue on our system? Understanding the scale of the problem is very crucial when you're sitting in a production. Uh, is this issue impacting a few set of users or only few set of tasks which are failing or the whole system is falling apart? So to proactively manage our system, it is essential to have the observability in place. This means having the tools and processes in position to comprehensively understand your system end to end. By doing so, we are better equipped to answer all these set of questions while sitting in a war room or trying to understand some production issues. Achieving observability involves more than just monitoring. We need to trace the issue back to its source and understand the chain of factors or events that can have contributed to the problem. Let's explore some of the key aspects of the observability. Logging and tracing. Logging captures events, errors, and transactions, providing a historical record for the troubleshooting and auditing. Each event is, in our use case is associated with an ID. And when it flows through different services, we make sure that ID is persisted across the whole system. And also, for that particular event, what all tasks we are executing, each task is further associated with an ID and we keep on logging that ID. So we should be able to filter down which all tasks executed as part of that event and what all failed and what succeeded. Tracing provides an end-to-end -end visibility into the processing of the event as it traverses through various services and components. This helps us to understand the point of failure and identify the checkpoint that should be monitored for any bottlenecks. Now, service metrics, so all the services in our ecosystem or end-to-end -end flow, we monitor it for the CPU, memory usage, to understand if there's any resources contention happening in the overall system. And we should be able to predict when it can fail, and we should be ready to upgrade our resources for that. The event metrics, we should be able to check what is the event processing time going on, 
is it under the control or is it taking longer what are the error rates error rate is specific to one specific service or one specific flow or is it like overall system what help us in most of the cases is the dashboard the one aggregated view of all these metrics that we are talking here where we can go and check all our error rates how how the processing time looks like what are the error counters looks like and at the end last but not least the alerts and notification we want to be get alerted whenever there is an increase in the processing time or in the error percentage in a complex distributed systems issue can arise from any of the service in your end to end system this could be within your code itself such as thread contention in some parallel processing especially during the spiky loads or it could be also related to the configuration of producers or the consumers or it might be some failure scaling issues in the dependent components distributed tracing so in netflix we have the open source zipkin which we used for the distributed tracing it's a powerful tool for gaining deep insight monitoring and profiling the performance of each component in our system it also provides a visual representation to trace the data it typically appears as a directed cyclic graph illustrating the relationship between the different spans each span represent a specific operation within the system how much time it is taking and what is the success or the error rate of each component by leveraging zipkin we can proactively identify and address the performance bottlenecks and troubleshoot the issues logging that is another crucial aspect of the monitoring we try to aggregate all logs from all our services into a centralized location we create a unified and easily accessible record of events this include error messages warnings information logs and many more the benefits of the centralized logging it allows us to perform comprehensive analysis for example i'm starting with one event id then it can drill down further like this event is specific to which asset id which version which tasks are executed as part of it and many more so you have to keep on adding the context when the event is processing through your system but with this kind of architecture these logs can grow exponentially you don't want to have the disk huge spike in your system so what you need at that the production issues you want to have some controls on top of your logs for every other service when you detect there is a some problem going on in specific service you should be able to turn on the logs the required logs at production time so we use uh, the again the spring aspects to enable or disable the logs specific to a service at run time in the production to debug such type of issues we continue adding the context in our logs that is very helpful to debug issues with our distributed systems monitoring monitoring our event based distributed systems is very important every other failures bring a kind of a learning into our systems we come up with a set of metrics that we should monitor and we make sure that our system is reliable and performant every service in the end to end workflow should be monitored for resource utilization that can potentially cause the errors or latency in the task processing latency of some of the task can be very crucial for our end users for example if high resolution image is uploaded and ui is waiting for the thumbnail generation or the compressed view of the image it should be done in sub seconds but if there is some spiky traffic going on and we are not handling the consumer configuration properly or there is some problem in the downstream service it can delay the processing and it can create the bad impact for our end users so keep an eye on the event queues and the message broker brokers monitoring queue length and the message processing rate can help us to find the spot the bottlenecks in the thing any deviation from the expected behavior should trigger the alerts while automated scaling can effectively handle most of the spikes in the request with our services but we have to make sure then when you are creating the auto scaling you know your limits of the auto scaling the another way in our use case we found that acknowledging event after processing works better for us rather than waiting for it to be processed by downstream service we immediately acknowledge that event is received and we persist it into a store 
if there is any error in the processing of the event, we send that event to a different Kafka topic. And a different set of consumer try to process this event. But again, not unlimited. We have a limit on the set of retry set. If still within those limits, the events are not processed, we persist that into a dead letter queue, which can be processed later whenever the system recovers. It helps us to make sure that our system is reliable and not dependent on the failures of any of the downstream services. And also we have the ability to pause our consumers because we don't want to cascade or have the more impact if one of the downstream service is down. We don't want to make the trouble more by adding more and more retries on top of the event processing. Also in case of failure, we publish the event uh, like showing here. In case of failures, we publish all the failed events to a different store. And whenever the service is up, we try to consume all the events again. Now, we're talking about so many steps here, but what help us to make sure that our system is reliable while we are designing so many different components here? We try to optimize on our testing. We should try to test each of the component independently in isolation. It could be producer, it could be consumer. Also at the same time, we should try to test this, to simulate the scenarios that validate the producer consumer and how they are working together. Item point and C, verifying the same event. We should try to design it in a way that same event can come multiple times, especially when we're trying to replay the same event in case of failures, it may be possible that we'll try to process the same event multiple times. So in our service, we try to design that even if the same event is received multiple times, we'll not try to process it again if it has already been processed. We should also try to test the replaying of the events. So we have very good framework of fetching the events which has failed to process earlier. So, but we would like to test it before rather than trying to test it directly in the production. Low testing. Simulate the high scale of events that your service and also dependent services can handle. That helps us to understand what are the scaling limits that can be configured. Dashboard, we have created an aggregated view of all the metrics that comes from different services. Here is just one snapshot, which is giving us the success and failure rates of each task that is executed on top of the assets. And we have the ability to filter down by each task from each stack so that if someone is reporting the issue, it may be the problem with one of the component only, which is impacting only one of the tasks, not all the tasks. So by drilling down the specific task, we can find out where the problem is. Also, we have configured and on our dashboard, the producer and the consumer metrics. And we have set up the alerts whenever it is goes any unusual metrics coming from the producer or something consumer lag is growing, we always receive the alerts. Like mentioned before, we have also set up the auto scaling limits for our system. Yeah, it's crucial to define the upper limits for each service. To again, going back to the previous point, avoid the cascading failures in our system. We cannot scale unlimitedly. We need to know what are the scaling limits, what are the minimum and what are the upper bounds so that you are not impacting any of the downstream service with the spike of event that you are creating with scaling up our clusters. Alerting. Alerting for any unusual task processing flow or latency in event processing is very crucial for us. But it is equally important that we have to make sure we receive alerts timely and every other alert that we are getting should be actionable. We should try to avoid unnecessary alerts for any expect, expected task behavior. For example, we know that some of the content uploaded to our system may have the invalid content and the inspection may fail. There's no point of setting up the alerts for every other inspection failures. We need to know what are the sources error, what are the system errors, and accordingly define the alerts for our event-driven systems. So here are some of the best practices that we discussed in our presentation. In the whole end-to-end -end flow, try to embrace the asynchronous communication patterns to decouple the producers and the consumers. 
At any point, you try to create direct communication in between the two components. You are converting your event-driven system from an asynchronous to the synchronous system because that can become your point of failures. Design consumers to be item potent, meaning that they can handle the same event multiple times without causing any side effects. Implement robust error handling mechanism and define the retry policies to handle the transient failures for any other downstream services. Again, design with failures in mind. Implement an event store for event persistence that empowers you the functionality like replaying of the event. It also help you to derive valuable insights for system optimization and performance enhancement based on the historical data analysis. Auto scaling, ensure cost efficient management of spike in events, ensuring system reliability for your crucial clients. Trust on the platform is very important. So does the monitoring and observability of your platform. They form the bedrock of your service reliability. They allow us to proactively identify and resolve potential hiccups, ensuring smooth and seamless task management for our digital assets platform. Hope you guys had fun time learning about our asset management, the behind the wheels world of production at Netflix. Thank you all.